We are in the uh, third week of a series called The Fight of Your Life, and we're finding out that sometimes it takes a little more courage to fight for those relationships, more energy, more tenacity to fight for them than to fight in them. Uh, last week we talked about marriage and some of you took the challenge to, to go home and treat your spouse like they were the most important person in the world. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I hope you did it. Heard lots of great reports about people that did it. And uh, I hope you've taken time to do a little selfie vow before this week is over, before today is over. Ask your spouse or your best friend, hey, did, uh, did I do a good job? Did you feel like the most important person in the world? And I hope they say yes. Lori and I uh, did the personal evaluation just this morning. I'm not going to tell you how it came out, but we did it. And, uh, you know, we have three grandkids that spent the la last night with us. It's not a great time to do evaluations. I'm just going to tell you that right now. But... Uh, Today we're going to see how this uh, principle applies to the parent-child relationship, but we're going to expand the relationship to include all ages and stages of parenthood. And uh, Psalm chapter 127 verse 3 tells us that children, they're a gift from the Lord. They are a re reward from Him. I just want to tell you that parenting is a unique blessing that brings with it some serious challenges. I, uh, I love this text between mom friends. Mom number one says, I'm done. I'm selling my kids on eBay. I get it. Mom two texts back and says, don't be crazy. You made him. Stuff you made goes on Etsy. So <laughs> as a parent of three kids uh, that are grown now, I can relate to what comedian Jim Gaffigan had to say about parenthood. He said, sometimes I feel unqualified to be a parent. I call those moments being awake. Uh, can anybody connect with that? Uh, some of us had fantastic parents. Uh, they made some sacrifices on your behalf. They provided you with incredible opportunities in life. I find it especially meaningful when people can say that I would point to my parents as the people who introduced me to Jesus Christ. Um, that's cause for celebra celebration. Uh, I'm thankful myself for a mother who loves God. Uh, she's open about her faith, and, and she did her best to point her two boys to Jesus. But I know that some of you didn't have a positive experience with your parents. Perhaps your parents were emotionally disconnected. Maybe you were abandoned by one or both of your parents. Maybe they hurt you in some way, either intentionally or unintentionally. Maybe you didn't feel like your parents were there for you. Or maybe you're one of those people that says your parents still make you feel like a, a helpless child even though you're 35 years old and have a family and a career of your own. You still feel like a little kid when they're around. Whatever your experience might be with your parents or with parenting, I can assure you that you are not alone. You may feel like you're alone. It may seem like you're alone at times, but you're not alone, so don't buy that lie. King David, uh, he made his share of parenting mistakes, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, including a few parenting fails. I, I think it's ironic and tragic that you take a guy like David, a David, uh, you know, he's this guy that has these incredible victories on the battlefield, and yet he couldn't seem to win at home. Have you ever seen anybody like that? you ever know anybody like that? I mean, I wonder what might have happened if he had fought as fiercely and courageously for his kids as he fought against enemies like the Philistines. David was an old man in the passage we're about to read, and he's on his deathbed, and he called for his son Solomon to come in and see him, and David had some things he wanted to share with his son Solomon. He wanted him to hear some things right from him. And in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, we get into this conversation where he says, hey, to Solomon, I'm going where everyone on earth must go someday. Take courage and be a man. So far, so good. You know, that sounds like a pretty good start to a father-son deathbed conversation. Verse 3, he goes on to say, Observe the requirements of the Lord our God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations, and laws written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all you do wherever you go. David's giving his son Solomon some really solid counsel right here. And then he throws out an interesting statement in verse 4. He says, if you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise he made to me. He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul, one of them will always sit 
on the throne of Israel. David knew that he had not been a very dependable father. It's apparent from the words that he's spoken that he knows time is running out. And he's trying to get his house in order. And so in the next few verses, he's trying to tie up a few loose ends and take care of what he perceives to be maybe a little bit of unfinished business in his life. And then in verse 10, we read that David died and was buried and his 40-year reign over Israel came to an end. And then verse 12 tells us Solomon became king and sat on the throne of his father, David, the throne that David himself had once occupied. See, when it comes to the matter of parenting, I just want you to hear this loud and clear, especially those of you that are in the midst of it right now. It is our responsibility to do the best that we can. And, and I believe every parent desires to be the best they can be. But there's a lot of pressure. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on kids today. There's no question about that. But let's be honest. There's a lot of pressure on parents, too, these days. And grandparents, I mean, many grandparents are raising their kids. And, and uh, you know, we, you know, parents, you want to make sure your kids measure up. We want to do our best for our kids. And we certainly want to be perceived as successful when it comes to this daunting task of raising children. And then you think about the fact that with the advent of social media, it feels like everybody's watching. Everybody's watching every move you make, and there's no end to the number of people who are ready to step up and pri provide some kind of critique for every parenting decision that you make. And so I want to make a point, this very first thing, if you're taking notes, I jot this down in your worship folder or on the app. I want you to get this loud and clear. God's grace is greater than my faults as a parent. That's really good news. God's grace is greater than my faults as a parent. That has application for grandparents too, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, we all want to measure up, but we walk a fine line as parents. And For instance, we want to protect our kids without being overprotective. Kind of a fine line there, don't you think? I mean, on the other hand, we get so busy that we are easily disconnected or uninvolved if we're not careful. And so the pendulum can swing too far in either direction. We're overprotective, we're uninvolved, we, we constantly struggle to discern how much should we let go and how much should we hold on. I mean, you can't hold on too long, but you don't want to let go too soon. You see what I mean? Parenting is such a daunting task. And I just want to tell you, we need God's help to get it right. We really do need God's help to get it right. See, parents are constantly trying to prepare their children to be the people that God created them to be and prepare them for everything that life's going to throw at them. The goal of parenting really is to move my child's dependence away from me and over to God. That's the idea. We're trying to move our child's dependence or our children's dependence from us to God. Instead of depending on us, we're wanting to teach them to depend on him. And we need to look to God for wisdom and discernment to help us as we seek to fulfill that responsibility. And we also need some friends who can be honest with us and help us see what we might not be able to see on our own. And so this morning, I'm going to give you just five basic practical parenting uh, tips or principles. And I, I think these are solid things that could help uh, in certain instances. The first one is this. Be consistent. Be consistent. Model what you want to see in your children. In other words, I would say to every parent here, walk the walk, don't just talk the talk. One of the things, the words I hate to hear out of a parent's mouth, do as I say, not as I do. Good luck. Good luck on that. The proverb writer challenges us to train up a child in the way he should go, but I've always thought it's a good idea to go that way first yourself. It's about consistency. It's about integrity in parenting. See, your children are far more likely to replicate what they see than what they hear. I always did my best to practice what my kids heard me preach. See, our first child was born four weeks before we took our first church. And uh, so they've only known their dad as a pastor. And so I wanted to make sure that my kids saw me practice what they heard me preach, and I wasn't perfect. I always tried to admit when I blew it. And I'm going to be honest and tell you, sometimes it took longer for me to know that I blew it than it maybe should have. 
I was convinced I didn't blow it. And, and I've learned later on that maybe I did, but then I'd go back. And because I wanted my kids to see integrity in me. I never wanted my kids to grow up and be those bitter preacher's kids that I'd heard about and and these kids that thought their dad was somebody different at church than at home or somebody that loved the church more than I loved them. And so I did the best I knew how. Didn't succeed always, but I did my best. And um, to be honest, that didn't always feel good enough in the moment and even now it doesn't always feel that way, but it's what God expects of us. Because really, what else can you do? You can only do your best. So be consistent. And remember, especially if your parenting years are over. And are they ever really over? (laughs) But even if you're not in the active role of parenting every day, day in and day out with underage kids, I want you to realize today that his grace is greater than our faults. And I just want to say, thank the Lord. And there's one child that's speaking up to affirm the things that I've said. Number two, principle in parenting number two, establish boundaries. Provide age-appropriate boundaries for your kids and then allow them to make decisions within those boundaries. Now, it's really important when you do this to make sure that those boundaries are established up front and clearly communicated. And I would just want to say to every parent, say yes to your kids as much as you can. Sometimes I think we kind of got in the mode of no, 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 no. It's like a broken record, and some of you don't even know what a record is. I don't, I don't guess electronic uh, music can get stuck, but the record player, it used to get stuck and just play the same thing over and over again. And I think sometimes as a parent, it just like the script was no. That's what the answer is. Can I do this? No. Can I go there? No. Can I buy? No, 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 no. We just do it. Back off. Back up. Say yes when you can. And there's a lot more opportunity for that than maybe we might think. Uh, Don't make every choice for your kids. Allow your kids to make some decisions and then allow them to reap the rewards of good choices and suffer the consequences of bad choices, poor choices. And even though it's hard on you, don't bail them out. Let them experience the pain of a bad decision. That's how they learn. And uh, that leads me to principle number three. Give them freedom to fail. Now, some of you may not like this one, but I I tell you, it helps uh, to remember that your kids are not your kids. You know, I hope you realize that. They're God's kids. And uh, he's placed them on loan to you for 18, maybe in some cases 22, hopefully no more than 23 or 4 years, okay? (laughs) Uh, The way we raise them will either prepare them for life or it'll hold them back. And uh, sometimes parents aren't, you know, they're afraid to let their kids fail. And instead of failing, they rescue them or they bail them out. Parents say, you know, hey, I rescue my kids because I love them. And that sounds so noble. But sometimes, if we could dig beneath the surface just a little bit, it's not only because you love them. I'm not denying your love for them. But sometimes we bail them out because we're afraid of what people will think of us as parents. Let your kids take responsibility for their actions. It is a part of the learning process for them. Number four, be approachable. Be approachable. Our kids need to know that we're approachable and we're available to them. And I just want to spell out that word approachable so everybody gets it. It's the way you spell approachable is T-I-M-E. That's how you spell approachable, T-I-M-E. Life is so stinking busy. I mean, you're going to have to fight to carve out time for your kids. That's the world we live in, but that's one way we let them know how important they are to us. I mean, you just can't say that, you know, do this parenting thing effectively by committing just a few minutes to a task every day. I mean, that's not going to work. Parenting requires large blocks of time and don't settle for being a pit stop parent. A pit stop parent is that person who thinks they can race into their kids' lives for just a few minutes every day and hand out some lunch money and meet a need or two and answer a couple of questions and give a few instructions and then race on with your day. You need to make time to be there for your kids. And don't just see them in passing. Make sure they know that you're approachable because here's the thing, parents, they need you. 
They need you. They may be going through something today and, and they choose not to say anything because they think you don't have time for them or you're too preoccupied or you're too grumpy or it was just too uncomfortable to bring up. And we've all been there. I mean, we've all been there. <clears throat> I can only speak from my own experience, but I can tell you that the demands and the challenges and the responsibility in the ministry sometimes are really heavy. And as Lori and I were raising kids, there were far too many times in our married life and our parenting life that I was too preoccupied just telling it like it is. I, I was too preoccupied. I, I was there physically, but I was not there emotionally or mentally. And, and so the challenges, I, t I believe today, are increasing more and more for parents with, uh, you know, laptop computers and iPads and, and this relentless connection to our cell phones. And I get it. I, re I really do. But please hear me. Nobody, nobody, no body can take your place in the life of your kids. Nobody. And uh, I just want you to make sure you're available to them and that you're approachable. Uh, somebody posted on Facebook just last night, I wish, it shows a picture of a little kid and it just says, I wish I was their phone. Then they would hold me and look at me all the time. Number five, lead your children spiritually. And folks, let me back up just a second. Not trying to say any of this to shame anybody, beat anybody up. These are just some challenges to say, hey, let's set a benchmark and let's shoot for a goal. And, and one of the things I like to hear people say, hey, I'd rather shoot for the moon and miss than shoot for a skunk and hit it. Let's, let's put our bar up here and let's go for it. And so be approachable with your kids. Number five, lead them spiritually. And there are all kinds of ways to do this. Bring them to church. Worship as a family. Read the Bible together. Let them see you reading God's word. Show them how to apply God's word to their lives. Let them see you pray. Show them how to pray. Pray with them. Pray for them. Show them how to have a daily devotional life. You know, parents, your child's spiritual development is a significant responsibility. And I'm going to back up and say, hey, dads, it's up to you to lead the way. I, I want to put this on you to say, this is your biblical responsibility to lead the way as the dad, the spiritual leader in your home. You know, what would it look like for you to give the best, think about this, the best of your time and your energy and your focus and your passion at home instead of pouring it all out at work for the company? or on the golf course, or someplace else? What would it look for you to give your best at home? See, discipleship begins right there. Teaching them to follow Jesus, that's where it all starts. And here at the point, we want to partner with parents in this process of raising their children to know and follow Jesus. You heard Tim and Annie talk about that earlier. It's what the orange philosophy is all about. Red represents the love of the family. Yellow represents the light of the church. Together, red and yellow make orange. And that partnership between the home and the church can create a powerful, meaningful influence in the lives of your kids. It's awesome to have other adults in the church who know and love your kids and, and take an interest in them. They can speak words that reinforce what you've already been saying at home. They speak words maybe that you've not spoken but that your kids need to hear. Our children and student ministries are designed to help equip you to be the primary influence in the spiritual lives of your kids. We want to reinforce that influence. We will do our best to resource you, but make no mistake about it. Parents are to be the primary influencer when it comes to the spiritual growth and development of your children. And you just need to hear me now. You cannot outsource that responsibility. You can't. You can't pass the buck. You can't hand it over. The, the church, though, is here to equip you to do what God has called you to do. And we want to resource you through things like the Parent Q app and through blogs and, and right now media and our worship services and a whole lot more. I think maybe now is a great time to check in with our counselor and friend from Tampa, Florida, Terry Kloss. And Terry has some great perspectives that I want you to hear about parenting. Take a look. Here are four closing thoughts about fighting for your kids. 
When it comes to parenting, you have to remember that it isn't just about focusing on how your children turn out. It's also about how we turn out as parents. I've had the privilege of being able to parent 12 children, two of bi my biological kids, one that we've adopted out of foster care, and nine kids that we have fostered in our home. And I can testify that God has done major work in our lives as a result of these parenting experiences while we were able to work in our kids' lives and help them understand what it means to love and follow the Lord. There's a reason why we call our kids our sanctification machines, because they push us to do that all the time. God uses our parenting experience in order for us to grow and change to look more like Christ and to work out the sin in our hearts. If your parenting experience is anything like mine, the sin issues rise to the surface as a parent, even when you real didn't realize they were there. This is actually a great book, Parenting, The 14 Gospel Principles by Paul David Tripp that speaks to a lot of these issues around parenting being something that is working in our lives, not just in our children's lives. The second tip to remember when fighting for your kids is knowing that God loves your kids more than you do. Their success in life doesn't all depend on you. It's the Holy Spirit working in you and through you in order for them to be successful in life to what God calls them to do. There's so much less pressure when you think about it that way. I've told my son many times as we've struggled through different things and seasons of academic struggles that my job as your mom isn't to get you into Harvard, it's to get you into heaven. The third thing to think about with parenting is remembering that the Great Commission applies to your parenting. We are called to make disciples, and that includes your children. There is no age restriction on the call to make disciples. And the last tip is remembering that one of the greatest gifts that you can give your kids is a God-glorifying marriage. So what we talked about last week with fighting for your marriage is actually a huge part of your parenting. I know this isn't always possible because of single parents. I was raised by a single parent. I know that well. Divorce, that is a difficult thing. But one of the greatest gifts that my mom was able to give me was that I could be around a lot of healthy marriages. And those examples helped me get a picture of what it looks like to be a healthy person in a healthy marriage. And that would be a great gift to give your kids if you could. Some great thoughts there in just a few moments. I, I love the idea that God can use even the process of parenting to refine in us the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's why Terry referenced the kids as sanctifying machines. I, I love that. We need to be intentional as we parent our children. We certainly need to be prayerful as parents. But I would tell you that prayerful is different than perfect. None of us are capable of parenting perfectly. Part of that is because none of us were parented perfectly. Perfect parenting is not possible, but prayerful and intentional parenting are possibilities for all of us. I want you to realize today that God loves your kids even more than you do, and, and you can do your part, and then you can trust God to do his part. He's in control, and he can be trusted. I heard a great story about a a uh, little girl that proves this point so well. It shows that God has unlimited resources to accomplish his will in our kids' lives. An 11-year-old girl was attending a child sponsorship event with her family, and her parents had already sponsored two or three kids, but the little girl came to her dad and said, Daddy, I want to sponsor a little child, a little girl of my own. And uh, the dad was a little bit reluctant because he assumed... Uh, she wouldn't follow through. The responsibility would fall back on him. And so this little girl, she was so insistent that her dad, he finally gave in and he agreed to let her sponsor a little girl about her same age. Over the next few years, his daughter, she did all kinds of odd jobs trying to raise a little money to be able to send to her sponsor child. And she did some babysitting and she got a little older. She got a job at a fast food restaurant 
Uh, the father was so proud of the fact that his daughter took this responsibility so seriously. And even while she was in high school and college, his daughter continued to send in those dollars to sponsor this girl. The father went on to tell about how between the ages of 16 and 19, his daughter was facing some real challenges in her life. And she started hanging out with the wrong crowd and she dated a boy who was a, a bad influence. And she began to question her belief in God. She didn't want to go to church with her family. Of course, her parents were so concerned and there was a lot of uncertainty about her future. But she went off to college where she met a great Christian guy and they were engaged to be married. One night, her and her fiance had gotten together with her parents and they were having dinner together and this young lady brought out a shoebox filled with the letters that she had received from her sponsor child. She invited her dad to read some of those letters. And as he did, he started to realize that when his daughter was talking, not talking to her mother and to him, she was actually confiding in her sponsor child. In those letters, he noticed that she spoke honestly about the questions she had about God. In those letters, she wrote about the temptations that she was facing. She even expressed some of her frustration with her parents. He was amazed to see how this girl was encouraging his daughter to make wise choices and to continue to love and trust her parents. And he said, it dawned on me there in that time, during those years when our daughter wasn't talking to us, God was talking to her. And he was using a sponsor, sponsored little girl, a little girl living in poverty on the other side of the world to direct his little girl's heart back to her heavenly father. Folks, that's the kind of big God we serve. I know parenting is hard. I know it can be painful. And you may feel like you are in way over your head. You may feel like your parenting doesn't measure up. I just want to invite you today to invite God to father you in the process of parenting. Allow him to guide you. Your job's not to make every decision for your kids. Your job isn't to control them. Your mission as a parent is to point your children to Jesus. And let's be prayerful and intentional as we seek to fulfill that responsibility as moms and dads and grandparents and caregivers. And if you're a parent of an adult child, could I just encourage you to remember how important it is to fight for that relationship, even that relationship may, that may be strained, fight for it rather than fighting in it because your relationship with your kids and your kids themselves, they're worth it. They're worth it. It's worth the fight. Don't go down without a fight. I want to invite you to listen closely to the words of a powerful song as you think about your responsibility to your kids.